You're listening to Bottom Shelf Bitcoin. This is episode 31. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bottom Shelf Bitcoin, the podcast that puts Bitcoin knowledge within everyone's reach. As always, I'm your host, Josh Humphrey, and today my guest is David Levine. Um, He is the founder of Odin River, and he also runs the Paranoid Bull Twitter account, which is kind of how I uh, found him. Um, So we're going to talk about kind of markets and some things like that, not necessarily specifically Bitcoin stuff, but uh, prescient stuff for right now. So David, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So David, kind of give us a little bit about your background and uh, kind of what you do and how you got where you're at. Sure. So I was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and grew up there my whole life and um, went away to college uh, up to the Midwest, um, to Wash U in St. Louis, where I, uh, played, played football, but, but kind of quickly realized I wasn't going to the NFL. So I shifted over to, um, to, to focus on finance and philosophy and, you know, philosophy was a big influence, um, then and now, um, and finance, you know, has kind of been how I spent my career since then. So, so my experience there was great. I moved up to the, um, to the Northeast was kind of recruited to wall street, um, Began at the company formerly known as Lehman, uh, and I uh, actually joined just just before, um, kind of right around the time of the dot com crash, and then also um, lived a few blocks away at nine eleven. So, um, kind of you know the beginning of my career experienced some some you know both market market collapse. You know I started in tech M and A, so so kind of saw that, and then um, at nine eleven, of course, um, living a few blocks away, so that that trauma of the system. Um, but but since that time, you know, through today, I, I've, I've remained very optimistic in the long run. I've been very kind of focused on tech in various ways throughout my career. Um, you know, professionally, have you know spent a couple of time, a couple of years in M and A, and then have, have shifted to the to the buy side of, of things um, since you know, the early two thousands. I, I was at a private equity firm for a while um, called Colony. That's that's now very big. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of, I, I did a JD and an MBA at Harvard, uh, you know, for graduate school. So at Harvard Business School, um, I was, you know, we're doing various things related to entrepreneurship, but also investing. And then at, at Harvard Law School, I was a teach, teaching assistant um, and research assistant for a professor uh, named Elizabeth Warren, who's gone on to do some uh, interesting things. And Yeah, uh, wow. Yeah, so she was great. And um, while I was there, I, you know, I kind of, had spent some time, um, you know, before school in private equity and I shifted, you know, more towards the hedge fund world. And I worked for a little while at, um, you know, this, this firm called Pamco, which is, is one of the biggest fund of funds. And then I, I, I worked at Canyon, um, which is, is one of the biggest hedge funds on the West coast. And right around that time, you know, this is kind of going back to 07. I had, um, you know, begun, I was very, very concerned about, about the markets. I was really, really worried about housing. Um, a lot of the work I was doing for, for now Senator Warren was focused on consumer finance. And so I, I had some insights into how bad it was. And so I started this blog called Paranoid Bull, where I would talk about, you know, the housing markets was going to collapse, the markets were going to collapse. And, you know, I'd, I'd been investing personally, you know, since my you know early 20s and so I was shorting banks and, and, you know, kind of shorting the markets and things and, and blogging about it. And actually back then, like 07, 08, I set up one of these feed burner accounts. So I was kind of tweeting about it, um, you know, back at that time, you know, again, this is going back a decade. Um, I've been tweeting every day for, for over 11 years. And so I would tweet about the markets, but I mainly blog about it at Paranoid Bull. And around that time, I met a guy named John Paulson, and he he was kind of um, in the process of constructing what's called the subprime trade. It was like the greatest trade in history, or whatever. And um, he was an HBS guy uh, from Harvard Business School, and so he, you know I got very fortunate in terms of the timing of things because I had been talking about the crisis and was kind of you know ahead of it in the same way that he was. Not you know not that I was a, anyway um, operating at the scale he was. You know he hired me to join his firm, so. 
after I did the JD and the MBA at Harvard, I, I worked at Paulson and Company. At the time, we were probably the I don't know one of the top three largest hedge funds in the world. I think we had close to forty billion in assets at peak, and it was a very small investment team. So, um, you know, that meant that I, I had you know was involved with many many of the largest restructurings last cycle. Um, became the largest shareholder of a company called Delphi and things like that. Um, you know, at one point was responsible for something like eight to $10 billion worth of positions. And so this is really kind of, you know, big job and, and a lot of experience. And so I, I, you know, learned a ton, um, kind of rode the cycle up in the sense that, you know, when I joined, it was, you know, the, the, the very bottom of things. And, and so rode, rode the cycle up in the sense of being long, many things, um, you know, worked across, you know, various different hedge fund strategies and, and really, um, you know, I think learned a ton. Um, but throughout that time, I continued to tweet, you know, every day, I, you know, by this point I was blogging on Medium and, and, and very involved in the, in the, you know, the, the tech ecosystem. And, you know, I had, had a number of ideas about um, kind of, you know, where things were going. And I, I started to synthesize them into this philosophy that I call Odin River. It's really about progress. Um, and cycles. And one of the ideas I had was, was wouldn't it be great if we could modernize hedge funds and make them more transparent and accessible and, and, you know, modernize private equity and make it more accessible. And I, you know, I met a guy at the time who had worked for Peter Thiel on the Facebook investment. I had known Peter a bit because I invited him to, um, to Harvard to, to debate the future of Facebook, which I live streamed and live tweeted, which nobody watched. <laughs> True story, like 2000, so it's on the internet and I tweeted every now and then. It was like go nine and I'm like, trying to get people to listen to Peter Thiel talking about the future of Facebook and nobody paid attention. But anyhow, but I, I kept in touch with him. So we, um, we, you know, when I left Paulson, I joined uh, James is his name. who worked for Peter and, and, and another couple of us. And we built, um, this company called Artivest with Peter and others backing, um, you know, some of the Silicon Valley folks, that company now has a hundred people in it. it. It's great. It's doing, I think very well, um, in modernizing alternatives, creating more access and, and, and kind of, improving the way that, that, um, you know, private funds, you know, can connect to a wider audience and, um, really great company and feel very, you know, fortunate to have, have been on the founding team of that and built it. Uh, but around, you know, 2015 or so, I started to get worried again about, um, where things were going in the markets. And, and, you know, by that point I had figured out, you know, what Odin river was about and, and, you know, really it's a, it's a philosophy, but it's also an investment strategy. And so, um, I set out, you know, to, to, to found Odin River, um, which I call a mission driven investment firm. Um, every company in the long run has to be mission driven. I'm actually very, very optimistic in the long run. And one of the most important themes, which will be relevant for this, you know, conversation is transparency. And so transparency, I think, modernizes every industry, especially finance. So I think it's really great what you're doing in terms of creating more transparency in, in Bitcoin and crypto. But Bitcoin and crypto itself can be seen as an emergent theme of transparency in, in, in finance. So, yeah, I've been following <clears throat> the crypto space since around, you know, 13, 2013 or so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm moderately knowledgeable. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've dabbled in it. Um, I have a lot of friends who are very, very smart. And so I kind of listen to them. Um, you know, but I've been building Odin River the last few years and, and I'm managing um, you know, a long, short strategy related to, um, progress through cycles. And, and as you mentioned, um, you know, for the last few years, I've been starting to get actually quite worried about the markets. And so I, I re kind of reactivated my paranoid bull, um, you know, blog and, and really converted it to almost exclusively Twitter now, because I think Twitter's kind of more appropriate than blogging, um, for real time things. And so, so yes, yeah, so I'm very active on, on Twitter and under the paranoid bull handle. I, I talk a lot about the cyclical nature of things because of where we are today, which is really, really um, quite frightening time. Um, so yeah, that, and, and, and you reached out and I, I think the idea of you know kind of creating more accessible conversations around Bitcoin is great. So I was really happy to connect and, uh, and chat more about it. Yeah, so... You, you talk a lot or you mention a lot this thing, the cycles matter and, and it kind of feels like from what I'm reading um, that, that we're kind of in a similar place or, or getting back to a similar place of maybe what happened in 2008 or more so even. Can you kind of talk about 
maybe what led up to 2008 for, you know, we, we kind of have a mixture. Bitcoin's kind of this weird mixture of, of all these different people from different backgrounds. And you get people who are um, very aware of things financially, but you also get people who are not super aware of things financially. And they just, they come from it from a, a technical side of things. So, or, or maybe they're just seeing all of it all right now for the first time. So can you kind of give us a, Maybe like what led up to 2008 or some things that, you know, it seems to be in the mainstream. It's like, oh, things just, uh, you know, happened and no one could have predicted it. But you're sitting here talking about like you saw the signs coming. So so what were those signs? Yeah. And, you know, I think that there were quite a few people who <clears throat> who did predict it last cycle. I was not the only one. I think um, there was a, a actually <clears throat> um, I would say more last cycle. Um at least it seemed that there were more that it were aware. I, this cycle is different in various ways. And in some ways you could say Bitcoin itself is an expression of doubt in the, in the system. And so I, I shouldn't say more people, it's just different. But, but back then, um, you know, it, it, the main thing that happens kind of, so I say, you know, that the, the mantra of Odin River is progress is inevitable, but cycles matter. And so cycles matter is, is kind of, you know, a mantra that I repeat um, as a reminder to folks that, Although it's true that progress is inevitable, and we see this in the in, actually in the crypto market today, you know the, the crypto market's collapsing because cycles matter, meaning risks risk exists, and if you underprice risk, it could come back to bite you. And so, so what happened, kind of going back in history, going back to actually, you know, kind of if you look at any historical chart of any any market, you see cycles, and and one of the main cycles um, that matters for financial markets is the credit cycle, and the credit cycle starting around. You know, really, the '90s there was a savings and loan crisis, and then right after 2000, you know, it was a dot-com collapse, and then um, the telecom crisis. And what happened after that was that the Federal Reserve, um, you know, Dr. Alan Greenspan, who was the chair, uh, reduced interest rates significantly in the mid 2000s. And what that did is it created what's called a search for yield. People were really couldn't couldn't get you know, kind of high yields in, in government debt. So they started to, to buy more risky things. And that led to a number of things, um, you know, primarily a, a credit um, boom and, and, and a lot of borrowing and lending. And, and but one of the areas that was most risky was the creation of what's called subprime mortgages in the housing markets. But subprime mortgages were, were just one of the things that was going on. There's actually kind of, you know, in, in, in the leveraged buyout market, this thing called CLOs, um, collateralized loan obligations. And um, one of the things that happened in, in, the, in the subprime mortgage market was the creation of, called, of what's called CDOs, um, collateralized debt obligations. And so these things were derivatives, CLOs and CDOs are derivatives that basically by bundling a bunch of stuff together, there's this idea that you make it less risky. However, the, the, the main assumption that underlied all of that, you know, kind of derivative architecture um, last cycle was that the U.S. housing market couldn't all fall at the same time. Because if you look at historically in statistics, you know, is the case that usually like if prices were following, uh, sorry, falling in, in Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, maybe in Bryan College Station, they were more stable. Or, or like if you were in Los Angeles and housing prices were falling, maybe in, in like Iowa, like, you know, housing, housing prices might be going up. And so historically, there was always this, you know, diversification effect that was um, present. But And the same was true for, for you know, for industries within the collateralized loan obligation or CLO market, you know, this idea of diversification was kind of a big assumption. But what happened was actually by 2006, um, housing prices were declining all, all around the United States. And so it was, it was actually disproven by, by 2007, it was quite clear that the assumption underlying um, CDOs was false, meaning housing was all declining at the same time. And so what, so what, what yeah, if I can interrupt you for a second. What, like what causes that? Cause I, I get that idea that like, if it goes down one place, it might go up somewhere else. Cause you, I, I, me personally, I would assume that that means people are moving from one area to another or something along those lines. Yeah. Or, or local economies are different. Actually this cycle, you know, not to digress too much, but actually this cycle, we're starting to, to see some dispersion in home prices. So it's actually interesting right now. Um, it's actually not the same as, as like 06, 07. You know, what happened then was that there was so much demand for, um, for you know, the kind of yield in the sense that the investors were really, really wanting to lend money in, in, in whatever way they could that, you know, Wall Street and then, you know, kind of mortgage originators, you know, 
got really creative in terms of bundling together more and more, you know, edge case or risky, um, you know, mortgages and, and loans of various kinds, but specifically mortgages, credit cards as well. And there's a lot of stuff that was going on, but, but mortgages was the main thing. And so this thing called subprime mortgage means people who didn't have very good credit were, were borrowing a lot. And because of the demand for this stuff, you know, people were, you know, basically the underwriting, you know, in terms of what people had to do to get a mortgage was, was very rudimentary, if, if at all. And there was fraud. There was other things that were, were going on too. But the main thing was just, you know, if you lend a whole lot of money to a whole lot of, you know, many, many risky borrowers, you know, the reason why they're risky is that, you know, they over time, you know, aren't able to necessarily pay things back. And so what happened was, you know, a, a lot of risky borrowers were kind of borrowing at the same time. And then when the economy started to slow a little bit, um, you know, they, they, they began to default. And then that, that kind of started a snowball effect with regard to both the housing market and then other markets um, in the economy. And, and then once that spilled over into, you know, kind of the broader markets because of the way that the loans were, were kind of spread out through the economy, it led to, you know, a, a, a pretty wide scale um, global recession and, and seizing of the financial um, system. Um, and a lot of that, you know, it kind of was really just all boiled down to an underpricing of risk. So, so, you know, whether it's, you know, lending too much to a subprime borrower or lending too much to a, to a more, you know, kind of a, a leveraged buyout or lending too much to you know, maybe a shaky company. It was just, it was a global credit binge um, and then bust. And so, and so, you know, by, by the time, you know, 2007 w was around, I think a lot of people um, had a feeling that this was going to be pretty widespread and systemic and, and, and it was, and, and the reason it was, was because the way, um, the way that, um, you know, these, you know, the mortgage market is about 12 trillion. So it's pretty big. Um, and so, you know, the U S mortgage market was, was syndicated and, and meaning, um, distributed, you know, loans were distributed fairly widely throughout the system, you know, Europe, United States, um, gotcha. Anyhow, so, so as the housing market turned, you know, it, ca it caused losses uh, across the system. And then, you know, the, the, the broader loan market, um, bank loan market turned and then more and the bond market. So the credit market kind of seized up and that, um, you know, forced, you know, many companies into bankruptcy. And then, you know, um, you know, the stock market as a result, you know, kind of collapsed. And, you know, the financial system contagion was 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 due to one of the things that happened was this, this idea of, of um, kind of writing insurance contracts or credit default swap um, w w without getting too esoteric, basically like, you know, insurance companies and, and big institutions were saying, look, we're so confident that this, these things, these CDOs are, are, are going to be safe that we'll, we'll ensure that they'll be safe. We'll write these insurance contracts. So when it turned out that that was you know wrong, um, there were there were quite a few losses. And for instance, AIG, which was a big insurer, they they would have completely gone bankrupt and, and liquidated um, in two thousand and eight. And Goldman Sachs would have failed. Morgan Stanley would have failed. Lehman failed because they let Lehman fail. But if if the if the Federal Reserve and the government had not intervened in two thousand and eight when they did, you know all all of these big institutions would have would have collapsed. Um, and liquidated. So it was, it was a pretty bad moment um, at that time. Um, but again, it, it was just a result of underpricing risk. And so, you know, the idea that cycles matter is just that risk exists. And if you ignore it for a long time, then it, it's going to come back to, to bite you. Um, and so that was, that was kind of, you know, what happened in 08. Um, and unfortunately, what, you know, it was a very difficult decision. I actually, you know, was blogging about it at the time. Um, there's some, blog posts on paranoidbull.com um, from around that time. And, and, you know, I was wrestling with whether or not I, I agreed with the decision to bail out the system. I mean, it, it was, it was a really precarious time. And, and I think um, probably the right thing to bail it out. I, the thing that I think was, was the mistake that was made then was that rather than, you know, forcing equity holders to, to, to kind of lose and, and management teams to, to maybe turn over. Um, what happened instead is that the same institutions that caused the last crisis were then were kind of bailed out in a way that they, you know, the shareholders and, and the management were kind of kept in place in a lot of cases. And so a lot of the things that led to the last crisis, including the CLO market, which is mind boggling, um, you know, kind of 
blown past previous peaks. Um, you know, I think partially as a result. The other main thing that that really happened, um, you know, kind of following away, um, was that because you know institutions were bailed out um, when when the when the Federal Reserve and then global central banks proceeded to reinflate the system by by you know forcing interest rates to be very very low and then um, doing what's called quantitative easing, uh, buying of assets to um, to kind of increase asset prices. A lot of the you know the the wealthy and the powerful and, and kind of folks who who maybe you know already had power in the system, um, a lot of them were the beneficiaries while normal people didn't really benefit um, over the last decade. And so, you know, one of the things that we see today is 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 populism um, all around the world. Um, you know, the election of, of 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 President Trump, the you know the 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 riots in the streets of Paris, the you know the election of of, of the far left and the far right um, in power in Italy, um, Brexit, uh, Greece before that, it, it's, it's kind of a global populist um, wave that that actually I think was caused by the way in which the system was bailed out and then reinflated um, over the last decade. So, so it's, you know, there's some ramifications about the way things were done that I think are now going to come back. And um, unfortunately, we're, we're going to suffer the consequences um, today. Yeah, it seems to me like, I mean, if I can just tell me if this analogy makes sense or not, it feels like, uh, you know, when your kid does something wrong and you say, hey, don't do that, but you don't give them any consequences for that and you don't explain to them why it was bad. And, you know, it's something, you know, whatever it is, and then you walk away and they just go back to doing it again. It's it's actually worse than that. It's like if your kid, um, you know, if your kid like knocks down like, like, you know, the most precious, like, like China, like that you have in your home and shatters it. And then you're like, Hey, don't do that. But then you say, Hey, here's an ice cream cone. And like, here, I'm going to take you and you're going to go like, like on vacation and, and to Disneyland. And then, and then, and then like, you kind of like, then take your kid back to the China shop and like, you know, have, have given them all this candy. And it's, it, <laughs> it's just, it's just not. It was like the opposite of consequences. It was like a bailout, and then and then gifts. Um, and the the gifts were just to be clear, like the the Federal Reserve intentionally increased the prices of assets. So so if you go back and read Bernanke's speeches following you know the crisis and then around 2010, 11, 12, um, he, their goal was to increase asset prices, home prices, and other asset prices. Um, with the theory being that that would stimulate the the economy, and it's actually true, it has stimulated the economy. So in a sense, like it quote unquote worked, but but there's many many side effects, and, and one of the major ones is you know increased wealth inequality, which is in my opinion the main driver of populism. So it's you know it's a, kind of like the law of unintended consequences. Like I think um, you know I have these academic theories, and the academic theories only you know work so well, and um, you know and now it's it's kind of you know. I, I believe we're, we're, we're kind of at the moment where the consequences are, are, are going to be felt in a, in a much more significant way. And they're already being felt, but it, it's actually going to, I think, get much worse from here. So, what, so what's going on right now? I guess let's go ahead and go into that. What are things that have happened since then that may have made it even worse or what's going on right now? Sure. So 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 let's kind of trace the, the thread of, of Satoshi and Bitcoin through today and I'll weave that in with um, with what's going on in, in the the kind of global um, you know macro economy so sure so around that time in 2008 um, you know some 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 anonymous um, you know computer scientist uh, Satoshi um, wrote uh, you know on bitcoin.org you can read the white paper if you haven't read it you should you must read it if you're listening to this um, there's so much good information out there on the founding of, of, of Bitcoin that, you know, it's, 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 it's great. It's one of the beautiful things about the open source community is that anyone can learn, um, you know, kind of wrote this white paper about this, this, this idea of, of, you know, internet money, you know, and there's, there's various debates about what the ultimate goal was and, and whether it's a store of value or medium of exchange or whatever. But, but the white paper itself talked about creating a, an immutable, um, distributed ledger that allowed, folks to overcome, you know, hard problems in computer science to have a trustless decentralized way to, um, to, to kind of, you know, pay each other for things on the internet. 
and and a lot of that was in response to you know the collapse of 08 and and kind of a, a concern about the central banking system and a concern about um you know so-called fiat aka you know the the government um money uh system and, and monetary policies of central banks and and so you know what's what's really interesting is that you know from that moment through today you know bitcoin at one point was you know the crypto market cap was over a trillion dollars in, in january of 2018 um but but the but from that moment to through today a lot of the concerns about monetary policy and about central banks have actually played out meaning what they've done um you know on the one hand you could say okay well they saved the system from from collapse which is true and they, and they stimulated the economy in the us which is true um the way they did that was was to to force interest rates meaning force the cost of government borrowing or the, the the compensation anyone received for lending to the government they forced it to zero and even negative in certain places negative interest rates um it still exists today which is insane and, and so doing that was kind of like a way more extreme version of what greenspan did in the mid 2000s i mean this was kind of like you know the most extreme um intervention in, in capital markets in history by like an order of magnitude and and they and they did it in a way um at first was just to, to kind of keep interest rates really low and th therefore make compensation for any risk um in my opinion be very underpriced they then even more dramatically did what's called quantitative easing and so so over the last decade um central banks if you ex exclude china because china is actually hard to know what what the real numbers are it, it's around 15 trillion dollars that um central banks mainly the us um, Japan, European Central Bank, and the Swiss National Bank um, have purchased fifteen trillion dollars of assets. In Japan, the Bank of Japan is like a, a top ten shareholder in like forty or fifty percent of the companies in Japan. They, they've gone so far as to buy stocks and ETFs. And in and, and Europe, um, you know, they, they've gone so far as to buy government, sorry, um, companies' bonds. You know, companies' debt. In the U.S., all we, you know, all the all the Fed did was to buy, um, you know, trillions of, of of government debt and also mortgage related debt. But you know what what that does is it kind of forces up the prices of everything. So so in a way, like the central banks not only reduced the compensation people got for risk, they increased the price of everything, and in, in, in my opinion, therefore made it riskier, both in the sense that if prices are higher, they can fall, but also as I mentioned earlier, I think they they introduced political risk to the system. Meaning, when you when you make the prices of everything very very high, you make the wealthy wealthier, and the poor people don't participate. The average person in the middle class doesn't participate. He or she, you know, I think gets understandably um, upset and feels like the system isn't working for them. And so that the populist response, in my opinion, is 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 a result of central bank policy. So, so it started as like a white paper. You know, let's say that that you know Satoshi and, and some of the early people in Bitcoin had had concerns about you know the central banking system. It, in a way, like maybe they were right, and so in a way, like maybe like the rise of Bitcoin and the rise of crypto was kind of like the market saying, "Wow, the fiat system is really really bad," and "Wow, I wish we had an alternative." And you know, the proliferation of of other kind of crypto currencies that are that are either imitations of or slightly different variations of Bitcoin. Where, where could be seen as as the, like really smart people saying we need a way out, we need an alternative, we need another way. Yeah, I, I had Dan held on uh, in my last episode, which has been a few weeks now. Um, but you know, he he kind of has this series of articles on Medium where he talks about like everything was very uh, the the timing and everything was it was almost perfect. You you almost really couldn't have planned it better. Of like, this was a reaction to what happened yeah but the, the there's a there's a depressing ending um and the depressing ending is first of all it's you know bitcoin is a speculative startup you know i, I it was founded the same time as uber it's roughly the same size as uber it's maybe a little smaller today um it's a really interesting and cool startup but it's a startup it's 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 absolutely tiny i mean um you know the global capital markets are about 300 trillion maybe they're 280 if you know if you include all the recent price um fluctuations the the, the derivatives market is quadrillions um many multiples of the um the financial market and and so you know in a way it's like 
the rise of crypto, you know, now it's, it's kind of collectively like about like a, a like a, a a half or a third of a visa, right? Like stock. It's like it's it's like so 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 tiny in the scheme of the capital markets that it it doesn't really matter. Meaning, you know, it, it, Bitcoin can be seen of two things. It, it seen two, seen in at least two different ways. The way I like to bucket it is, is kind of like it's it's a technology startup in the sense that it's it's a really interesting distributed. Um, technology infrastructure that that has like an immutable distributed ledger that's that, that's kind of controlled by by you know let, let's say it's decentralized it's it's relatively relatively centralized in the sense that there's a the kind of a core um, developer community and a core mining community that have a lot of control but but is way more decentralized than than you know any other you know startup um, that I know of that's that's reached the scale I mean not that I know of probably in history besides maybe the internet. Um, which is free and open source, and, and so in that way, it's it's kind of like maybe even bigger than Bitcoin, but it's it's not as as relevant in that it's not like kind of a financial model; it's more of just an operating model. But but it's it's definitely like kind of one of the most decentralized things ever, and and, and definitely probably the most just I would say definitely the most decentralized um, thing that has been worth you know a hundred billion or hundreds of billions of dollars. Um. You know, but it's just it, it's so in that way it's like a startup, and that's why like the price is so volatile because startup you know equity is a very very volatile asset class. Uh, sure. You know, it's down ninety percent because you know if you look at angel investments, nine out of ten angel investments fail. So of course, like nine out of ten ICOs will fail. Like that's just startups. So I'm not like you know it's not like like any different. It's just very liquid and then and very speculative, especially some of the ICOs ignoring the fraud. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, there's, and there's lots of that, but yeah, we, we, we set that aside, you know, people are trying to do new things and yeah, you know, like I said, nine out of 10 angel investments fail, like, you know, in, in venture capital funds, like about half of the companies will return zero. And so it's like quite common for startups to fail. It's just with, with crypto, it's like kind of like a very, very liquid angel investment asset class with some venture in it, like Bitcoin's venture and maybe Ethereum's venture, a lot, a lot of, you know, kind of the more established I mean, sorry. The the newer projects are, are more like angel. So it's it's just it's 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 small and it's early. Um, the other thing that you know you could say that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies offer an alternative to fiat, but but they don't. It's just it's way too small. Um, it's way too early, and you know it, it it can't it can't be a store of value yet if it collapses ninety percent or eighty percent in a year. So it's just not there yet in terms of being stable. Um, you know, so, so some some smart folks think, okay, well, over time it will become a store of value, and at that point, it'll be an alternative to to fiat. And maybe I think it's possible. We'll see. You know, I think incredible work going on in the Lightning Network, and incredible work. Um, you know, the people have continued to do in and around Bitcoin. So I'm not not saying that it won't. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we're at a moment where the you know the the the, the consequences of, of what's been going on in the, in the financial markets and in the global monetary system. You know. Um, 20 you know, if you include china 21 plus trillion of quantitative easing and um you know uh, all-time high in, in in debt um global borrowing in all-time high in U u.s household borrowing um you know all-time um i mean unprecedented in all-time meaning it never existed before central bank intervention um and holding of, of assets and and all of this is is kind of like an underpricing of risk. It's it's actually like in very it's very similar to what happened in 08 in the sense that like in 08 we thought okay well let me sorry no six oh seven it was like well housing can't fall at once. I think the main thing that's been mis mispriced this cycle is political risk because underlying all of these interventions was well if we make government interest rates zero it's okay because governments are are, are safe and, and and governments you know are are, are immutable they're 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 infallible. I, I like to say that there's there's been this myth of the infallible central bank um, as one of the things that that you know is underlying a lot of what's been going on. But unfortunately, you know, the like not only are, do we think that they're they're fallible, we actually literally learned in 2008 that the central banks are fallible and that they, they should have prevented that from ever arising. Um, and 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 populism and the revolt that we've seen, you know, if Donald Trump can beat both the Democrats and the Republicans. If Donald Trump, a real estate entrepreneur who's done like, you know, leveraged buyouts of casinos and gone bankrupt and done all sorts of risky things and 
you know, he's an entrepreneurial guy. Like he, he, he started a reality TV show. Like he, he's an entrepreneur. If he can beat both Republicans and the Democrats due to the level of populism we have in the United States, like things are risky. Like there's a lot of, Oh yeah, for sure. So, so, so I think that, um, you know, we know, we know, not only do we have to speculate, but we know that governments are risky. We know populism is, is a real thing. And, um, and yet, you know, central banks forced the world um, to price government debt um, as if there was no risk. And so I think what that means is that systemic risk was underpriced and therefore um, it seems quite likely that systemic risk will emerge um, this cycle. And I actually think it could be worse in 2008 um, in various ways. And uh, and so here we are. I think it's, you know, we're at the moment um, in time where, where some of that's playing out. And, um, you know, it's not fun. Yeah. If we can back up for just a second, when you talk about like decreasing interest rates and some of that stuff, um, if I'm, if I'm kind of hearing what you're saying the right way, it screws up or, or changes people's incentives and like someone who might normally not be interested in that deal is now able to afford it or at least thinks they can afford it. Is that kind of what happens? Um, the way to think about it, um, is that, um, like whenever you're so, so borrowing and lending should be based on risk. And like, if you lend somebody money or you lend a company money or you lend a country money, you should be compensated based on that risk. So like lending money to Venezuela is a lot riskier than lending money to the U.S. government. And sure. interest rates, you know, in a market, they they represent the the risk of the borrower. Like, are they going to pay you back? And so, there's this idea that that the U.S. government is risk free, quote unquote, risk free, because the U.S. government can always, if they have to, print more money and give you that money back, theoretically. Now that idea of risk-free, um, you know, there, there are limits to that idea, and the limits of that idea are, well, let's say the government doesn't exist anymore. Like in Europe, there's actually legal limits. Europe, it's way worse because it's, it's a, it's you know, the power of the ECB is based on a treaty with like 16 different countries who have you know different interests, and it's like not even close to risk-free in Europe. I mean, it's it's. It's really just contingent on a bunch of agreements. But even in the U.S., you know, as we see whenever you have the president threatening, you know, the, the Federal Reserve chairman and then maybe he changes his mind because of tweets, like that's that's kind of risky, man. It, it, <laughs> yeah. It's like it, it's not, you know, in your textbook, you like read on page 47, it says risk-free rate, U.S. government. And so the, there's an academic idea behind it, but the reality of it, you know, there's war. I mean, there's all sorts of things, you know, political risks um, that are fundamental to, um, you know, the world. And one of those risks is like, what if, you know, the central banks kind of go gangbusters and give everybody free money and, and, and underpriced risk and, and bid up assets and create populism? And then you have revolts, you have riots on the streets. I mean, even in the United States, we have like this Antifa versus right wing movement. We got people fighting and kicking each other and like some people dying on the streets of the United States based on politics. I mean, that's, that's no joke, man. And like these, these like serial machine gun uh, killings at, at schools and things. I mean, that's, that's all about this kind of political moment we're in. So, I mean, in France, it's, you know, it's, it's more explicit. The French are very political. They're, they're kind of rioting against the you know, the, the wealthy class in Italy. I mean, in Italy, it's, it's, Italy's been the most, obvious example and so i've spoken about that mostly in my newsletters and, and on on twitter because there you got the you know the far right which is called lega it's actually right of donald trump and on the left um you have the five star movement um which is left of sanders and they're actually the coalition government in italy right now which is, is crazy you could you imagine like donald trump vp bernie like that that would be the government. it's literally the government in italy right now it's not I'm not exaggerating. So it's actually more like Bannon and Bernie because the, the <laughs> seriously, I'm not even joking. Like Salvini, who who runs Lega, is um is actually more he's right of Trump. So it's, anyways, it's just 
it's everywhere. Um, you know, risk exists. And now the reckoning, and now the reckoning. So um, the reckoning is that, you know, whenever you misprice risk, you have losses and there's losses. If, if you misprice risk on the order of the entire system, then in my opinion, you could have, you know, levels of losses that would threaten the, the entire system. So I think that's, you know, we, we, we've been here before, you know, we, we kind of didn't learn the lesson in 08. And, um, and now, unfortunately, I, I think maybe this time we'll learn. I don't know. Um, maybe people will never learn. I don't know. Um, but I, I think, you know, th this year, nine, zero, 90% of assets are, are down. 90% of all asset classes are down on the, on the year. Wow. Credit equities, China's in a bear market, Germany's markets down. Like it's, it's, you know, we, and for this audience, of course, we know crypto's down a ton, but I mean, it, it's, this is a global phenomenon and, um, you know, it's only beginning actually. This, um, you know, this week in the markets, um, you know, not, not sure when the, the podcast will air, but, but this week in the markets in, in December of 2018 is the worst um, beginning to December in, in, in history. And maybe it'll bounce or you could bounce back. You never know. I'm, I'm not one to know um, the daily movements of things, but, um, but things are not looking very good right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so do you, what do you think would be like, if, if things really did not bounce back, what would be like a precipitating type of, of event or, or is it just kind of everything altogether that just keeps working together? Well, one, one of the things that's been going on, um, so there's a natural cyclical nature of things and, uh, meaning, the business cycle and the credit cycle and the business cycle and credit cycle are related. Um, a credit cycle has to do with you, you lend, you know, a lot of money to companies over time, you lend too much and then, you know, the companies start to default and go bankrupt. And so credit contracts and in 2015, um, it actually started to, to turn meaning defaults were going up and, and the markets actually in, in February of 2016 hit very important technical levels. Um, but at that time, the Federal Reserve stopped hiking. They, they, they stopped raising interest rates. The um, Bank of Japan got even more aggressive with their monetary policy, and so did the ECB. So you had a global intervention that kind of kept markets from, from running their natural course at that time. And that created um, the blow-off top, um, which I think was 2017 when crypto went to a trillion, when the S&P 500 was, had a sharp ratio of 2.7, meaning had very, very little volatility and went up, 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 up. And then actually the FANG, kind of like Facebook, app, Apple, Netflix, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google um, stocks kind of went went vertical through actually this year. All that was created by this last intervention. And, and so I think what happened at that moment was that rather than having a normal cycle, it became a systemic cycle. Um, so, 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 so there are some like a kick the can down the road kind of thing and down the road. And then, and then what happened was that, you know, that's when we, we got, um, at one point, more than ten trillion dollars of negatively yielding government debt, which never happened. Ne negative yields are, are, are totally it, it it should not exist because you're basically paying to lend, like saying, "Okay, here you borrow my money, I'm going to pay you." That's like the crazy yeah, thing in the world. It's crazy. And so there's ten tr trillion dollars of um, so ten ten cryptos at peak of negatively yielding sovereign credit. Um, it's less than that now, but it's still many trillions, primarily in Europe and Japan, but. But anyway, so, so I think that um, unfortunately, like so, so in terms of event, like kind of what is it, the quote unquote catalyst? I mean, there are many that are already ongoing. One is that um, you know the Chinese economy is rolling over, fixed um, fixed asset spending, um, investment is, is declining, exports are declining, um, industries like automotive and semiconductors are, are, are declining. Um, that's kind of you know kind of fundamental growth slowing. Um, same things happening in Europe and Germany. Um, and so you get kind of like slow down in 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 um in the fundamentals of the economy, which were actually part of the thing that caused you know oh eight as well. It was it was kind of housing, but then the economic slowdown. Um, the other thing that's happening though is that, that that political risk is increasing, and so you know you have a fight right now still ongoing between Italy and the European Commission. You have Brexit actually ongoing. There's a battle currently today um, in the UK Parliament between the you know the government and, and the people about what's going to happen. Um, you know, in the U.S., you know, I, I, 
president under investigation by special counsel. He's threatening the council. Um, you have, you know, all sorts of kind of um, really unpredictable dynamics in, in our domestic politics. And then, of course, you have, you know, a trade war um, between the U.S. and China, where you have now like one of the um, daughters of a, of a Chinese billionaire being arrested um, and, uh, you know, the Chinese government threatening the U.S. As of today, the Chi Chinese government um, is kind of shutting down some of Apple's sales. So, 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 you know, that, that is, that is increased political risk. And so, so the political risk is actually increasing, um, which, you know, means that in my opinion, it's, 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 it's probably the case that government debt has been even, been even more underpriced than, you know, than maybe, you know, we, we, we thought before. Um, and so, so the, you know, in terms of quote unquote events, I mean, I think that, um, those are all various things that are happening. I think, you know, the U.S. equity market right now is at a very critical level in the sense that it, it's kind of been able to stabilize without breaking through um, a certain levels. But now, you know, it's, it's kind of starting to, um, you know, break down and, and kind of, you know, move into more of a collapse or, or, or violent sell-off territory. Um and so, you know, it's, it's, there's just a lot of things that are, that are, that are happening, um, that are all kind of various, you know, expressions of mispriced risk. And I think that, um, you know, whether it's kind of like normalizing multiples in, in equity markets, meaning prices coming down because interest rates are higher, whether it's margins of, of companies going down from the peaks they've been at because of both populist backlash, slow down the economy and other factors, um, these sorts of things can, will cause, you know, the equity markets to decline significantly. And, you know, the credit markets, um, you know, yields, meaning the interest rates have started to go up, which is typically something that happens before, you know, a lot of bankruptcies emerge. And, 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 and so the credit cycle, you know, probably will run its course. It seems possible. Um, I would say probable that, um, you know, that there's a moment, I, I call it the systemic moment, um, when the system seizes up in, in the same way it did in 08. And, uh, you know, if that happens, it, you know, it, it could be very bad, you know. Um, you know, if we have a financial system seize up. Um, I, I hope we can avoid war. I mean, that would be very bad. Like, I really don't want there to be geopolitical consequences. I think it's possible, um, given all of the, you know, conflicts that, um, you know, that in a moment of crisis that someone might, maybe a bad actor makes an aggressive move or, or someone else makes a hasty move and things escalate into kind of a geopolitical crisis. Um, yeah. So there's all sorts of things I think could happen um, that, uh, you know, would make things worse. Um, but uh, in some ways it's just a natural consequence that comes from underpricing risk. So, um, you know, these, these things happen. It's just the, the, the nature of things. So, so then with all of this, uh, what seems like very bad or worsening or whatever. Um, why, why choose, why choose the name bull? Oh, because I'm extremely optimistic in the long run. So don't, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. So, um, so paranoid bull and Odin river, they're both this idea of progress through cycles. So paranoid bull was like, I was really worried about the, um, the markets, but, but don't worry, you should tweet and don't worry, you know, blogging is, is, is a good thing. And don't worry, Google will be great. Don't worry, Facebook's going to be really interesting. And don't worry. There's all sorts of, of great innovations that, um, that emerge. And so, so look, I mean, the existence of podcasts like this, um, you know, the increased transparency that, that exists today in finance is, is like un never before. That's only going to increase, um, you know, things like crypto and, and other innovations in finance, whether it's FinTech, whether it's, um, kind of like reducing the, the fees of, of, of things like beta. Uh, it's amazing. Vanguard, you know, has made beta free. Unfortunately, you know, maybe too many people thought um, passive investing is, is, is totally safe. So that's, that's a downside. But, but on the upside, you know, I think in the long run, like, you know, finance is going to be way, way more accessible and more people. There's people doing amazing work in Africa to kind of re reimagine, you know, the financial ins institutions from the ground up. A lot of people in the crypto community doing really interesting, innovative things there. Um, so, so, so in the very long run, like I actually think, you know, we'll live in a freer, more transparent, more just, and actually even, even, you know, one of the themes I believe in very much is wellness, you know, and wellness for the earth and wellness for the individual. So 
whether it's biotech or things like meditation and, and yoga, which are now globally very popular, um, you know, whether it's more increased nutrition, there's all sorts of things. You know, human lifespans are, are at all-time highs, um, general well-being is all-time highs. So, so I think in the very long run, like, you know, we will achieve transparency and justice and wellness. Um, you know, in a way, like, you know, there's this idea um, called creative destruction, which comes from this economist, the Schump Schumpeter, who, who took the idea from Nietzsche, who took the idea from Hegel. And Hegel has been a very, very big influence of mine. Um, that, that, you know, in a way you clear out the old, you, you create way, ways for the new, you know, if these old companies, the old systems collapse, well, that, that, that creates more room for innovators. It creates more room for, for new innovations and, and, and more, um, more transparent and just and, 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 you know, sustainable ways of doing business. And, and so, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll solve things like climate change. I, I'm quite confident that, um, sustainability will emerge in, in, you know, in a very long, long period of time, there's great things happening. Um, you know, my wife runs a family owned biogas business. Biogas is great as a, as a solution. Um, I'm an angel investor in an in electric, you know, vehicle company. I'm, I'm involved in various things related to electrification of our, um, grid and modernizing our, our, our energy systems. And so I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic in, in, you know, the long run that will, and I'm actually very optimistic about America. I'm patriotic. I believe our values of equality and justice and, and, and liberty are great. Um, you know, I, I don't like either the Republicans or the Democrats. You know, I think they've both failed the people. So our divisive times are a sign of that. Um, so we need to move beyond, like, you know, some old ways of doing things. And, you know, so maybe if the system collapses, uh, maybe that would be a really good thing because maybe we would clear the space for new new ways of doing things. So um, I'm actually very, very optimistic in the long run. Uh, it's just the short run that um, unfortunately is not not so rosy. Yeah. So, so it's just a, it's going to get, have to get a little worse or maybe a lot worse before it gets better. I think, I think you'd make a good hodler, man. Like this is, that's the, the mindset of like, hey, yeah, no, I mean, um, I, you know, like I said, I've been, I've been dabbling for a while. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not against Bitcoin. I think it's really interesting. And I, I think I put it in my, um, speculative bucket of things that I believe in. Sure. Like I, I, I think it, it could very well. Um, but I, to be honest, like I, I think some of the newer, like some of the Z snark stuff, some of like the really cool, um, new, new approaches to, um, you know, kind of, you know, whether it's encryption or, or decentralization that are, that are kind of not reliant on a, like a very, um, like dirty and expensive form of, of electricity consumption, which Bitcoin is. Uh, uh, but a lot of it's like a lot of the mining is is <laughs> off of uh, we could we could have this conversation for a long time. But uh, I just wanted to you know it's, troll the audience to see who's paying attention. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I I know there's a debate there, and I, I my 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 view is that electric electricity can be renewable. I think it will be over time. But the, the truth is that many of the Bitcoin mines, especially in China, are dirty. But I, I, I who knows? I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I think that the idea of of proof of work. As the only, meaning energy, consuming energy is the only way to to um, to have an immutable dis, dis, distributed ledger. I, I don't I don't know that I agree with that. I think there may be technological innovations that can make it more efficient. And um, and so I'm interested in stuff like that. Like I, I think Lightning Network is really awesome. Like I know um, CEO there, the founder there, she she's incredible. Um, I've known her for a long time. So I you know I, I and and people are doing really cool stuff. There's a lot of really interesting innovative things happening in crypto, but but also not just crypto. And like I said, fintech and legal tech and um you know people doing really interesting things in energy and and you know um you know ultra rapid recharging of of cars and and all sorts of of innovation. So I'm I'm very optimistic. I really am in the long run. It's just the short run is is unfortunately quite bad. Um you know, for the legacy system. Yeah. So do you have any recommendations of what, you know, average everyday people could or should be, just be doing? I mean, not, not, not a official financial legal yeah, advice or anything. Safe, but... You know, I just, just be safe. It's risky. It's a risky time. Just be safe. It's the only thing I would say is just, you know, use your common sense. Like it, it, from my vantage point, it's like if I look at TV and the TV, I don't watch TV, but if I did, if I look at Twitter, if I look at what's going on in the world and I see, you know, wow, that is really crazy. There's some riots and 
you know, the system is, is very volatile. And then I look at the markets and they're at all time highs. It just doesn't make sense. It, it, it's a disconnect. And so I think people, people have, you know, common sense intuitions that can help them to be safe in this time. So I, I just, you know, I'm not advising to your point. I'm not giving people financial advice, but I give them common sense advice to be safe. And, um, you know, it's just these things happen. We have cycles and we, we got through 08 and we'll get through 2019 or whatever it is. And um, you know, in the long run, I, I'm quite optimistic about our country. I'm quite optimistic about innovation. And, and so I think, you know, it'll be, you know, 10 years, things will be really even better than they are now. Um, so, so that's, I guess, I don't know if that's helpful, but that would be something I would say. Cool. Cool, man. Well, um, David, I appreciate you coming on the show. Is there anything else that you think we need to hit or, or go over? No, just, just, you know, um, if you're interested in, in following along with the things that I'm talking about now, I, I am pretty active on Twitter at paranoid, P A R A N O I D bull dot. No, actually at paranoid bull, the dot com. I don't use as much, but, um, but yeah, follow me there. My, my main handle is Dave A. Levine. Uh, that's a little less dark. But um, <laughs> if you're interested in the, in the markets, I would follow my Paranoid Bull account. All right. And I'll have links to all that uh, in the show notes for this episode. This is episode 31. So bottomshelfbitcoin.com slash 31. Or, you know, just subscribe to the show and uh, you'll get the, the updates automatically. Um, yeah. David, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll uh, talk soon. All right. All right, guys, that's going to do it for our show today. Big thanks to David for coming on. Um, you guys go follow him. I'll leave links to both his personal and Paranoid Bull Twitter accounts in the show notes, um, as well as um, his Medium page for Odin River. Um, you guys check that stuff out. And, um, yeah, like you said, be safe out there with the way you spend your money and the uh, way you invest and save. Um, read up on stuff be aware, you know, we always talk about this, especially in Bitcoin. Um, but, uh, you know, in all these things, read up and be aware of what you're putting your money in and, um, how things have been in the past and where they might be going in the future. Obviously none of us can predict the future for sure, but you can have a good idea of where things are going. And, um, yeah, if you want to support the show, you can always, um, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is always retweet this or uh, share the episodes with your family and friends and strangers on the internet. And um, and then, you know, of course, uh, I've got the TallyCoin donation page set up. Um, and uh, I've got the patches still, as well as just the donation page or Patreon as well. All that stuff's in the show notes. You can, you can get the links to that there. Um, Hit me up on Twitter, bottom shelf BTC. Um, you know, my DMs are open. So if you got something you want to talk about or uh, suggest a guest, shoot me that. From Bottom Shelf Bitcoin, I'm Josh Humphrey. Thanks for listening. <laughs>